Uh, my name is Reno Patty. Um, my connection with the archives is a bit interesting. I was dean of the School of Social Work when uh, Francis Feldman and Ruth Britton were just getting the archives cranked up and uh, I've watched it over develop over the years and it's uh, just uh, phenomenal what Esther and others have done to uh, uh, make this a really usable uh, uh, and, uh, and distinguished really collection of, uh, of uh, documents and interviews. Uh, we're here today at the uh, Marriott <coughs> Airport Hotel in Burbank, beautiful Burbank, California. Uh, and uh, we're, uh, it's uh, October 25th, and we're introducing the very distinguished Professor Fernando Torresquil. Uh, he is uh, a professor at uh, UCLA, and we'll learn a lot more about him and uh, what he's up to as we proceed through the interview. Let me start, uh, Fernando, by asking you, uh, could you highlight some aspects of your childhood that might have had a bearing on the field that you ultimately took? Thank you, uh, Professor Patty, Reno, if I may call you. Sure. And yes. first, for the uh, purpose of the archives and history, I need to thank you for your guidance, your coaching, your mentorship over the years. So thank you for all you've done for me, Professor Patty. And uh, it's an honor that you're here to interview me and that you're here to uh, introduce me to the audience as I received the award which you yourself received some years ago. And so thank you, Reno. It's, a, you. it's a real treat Appreciate to have you quiz me, interrogate me. So. Okay, all right. So back to uh, your question, which yeah. I think you were asking about my early upbringing. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, if since our time is somewhat limited, if you could focus on maybe some aspects of your childhood mm -hmm. that might have, now in retrospect, might have influenced how you move toward uh, the general field of human services, mm -hmm. public policy, and so on. Great. Well, I will give you a mercifully short overview of what has uh, influenced me to move into the field, both of social work, social welfare, and social policy which I distinguish as three separate but overlapping aspects of uh, social work. And I give really uh, the first credit goes to my mother and my grandmother. And uh, the second uh, set of influences, certainly how I was raised and what our family went through. And then thirdly, uh, my disability, which factors into this. But suffice to say, my grandmother and grandparents came from Mexico like thousands of others. In their case, they came here fleeing the Mexican Revolution, seeking a new life for themselves and ultimately their 10 children. And they were migrant farm workers uh, working up and down the California coast and the Central Valley. So that's a story like thousands of other mm -hmm. uh, immigrants mm -hmm. to this great state. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother uh, married relatively young. She married a bracero. Uh, my father came here during the uh, that program that brought guest workers to California during World War II. They met, married, and subsequently had nine children. Uh, but not unlike a lot of other families, uh, the marriage did not work out. Our father left the family and returned to Mexico, leaving my mother alone to raise nine children. Mm -hmm. And rather than falling apart or turning her kids into latchkey kids, she took it upon herself to sacrifice her life, her future, her dreams, and uh, focused on raising us, ensuring that we had a good education. But she had to swallow her pride and go on AFDC, if you recall the old welfare mm -hmm. program, Indeed. aid to families Indeed. with dependent children, and move us into the public housing projects of Salinas, California. Mm. And that's where we were raised public housing, AFDC, and benefiting from that uh, really robust social safety net of the 1950s, 60s, 1970s. Her additional challenge is that uh, her oldest son, myself, uh, acquired contracted polio at a very young age. And so at six months of age, I contracted polio. And from that time on until about 18 years of age, I spent my time back and forth from Salinas to San Francisco 
where I spent many years at Shriners Hospital in San Francisco, mm. uh, going through the various surgeries, rehabilitation, and all that was necessary to give me a chance to be independent mm. and to be ambulatory once again. So those events, how my parents and grandparents came to the United States, what my mother had to go through to sacrifice, to focus and raise her children, and certainly my own personal challenges have all been a factor in terms of what I have subsequently decided to do with my career. It, uh, if you could uh, maybe pinpoint that very interesting and, and uh, challenging uh, upbringing, uh, you can pinpoint, like, when did you begin to think that uh, there might be a place in this world for you uh, helping other people? Good point. You know, like all the rest of us, you know, we get the values, the influence, the virtues, the traditions from those who are parents, grandparents, mentors, surrogates, those who care enough about us when we are going through our formative years. Mm -hmm. And I was so fortunate to have not just my mother and my grandmother, but to have other people around us, whether it was other social workers or law enforcement. And in our case, uh, we had two wonderful social workers assigned to my mother mm. and my siblings to provide parenting support to ensure that we could find whatever necessary services, whether dental care, mental health care, medical care, assistance with the educational system. They were our advocates. Mm -hmm. And uh, those social workers became my mom's best friends. And over the years, I became very close to them. So seeing the role of a social worker to guide us, mm -hmm. advocate for us, help us to deal with the complexities of whatever might be out there was certainly very big. My mother also believed in the virtues of reciprocity and giving back. As she would tell us, if government and social workers and charitable groups like Rotary or Lions Clubs are doing these things for you, you must give back. There are no free handouts. Mm. You must do for others as they have done for you. And that was just embedded in our DNA mm. growing up. Mm. And she also stressed, you will not live like I have. You will get an education. So my mother made it a point to go on AFDC so she could stay there. She was involved in our schooling. She went to every PTA meeting. Mm. She made sure that each of us learned an instrument. She gave permission to the school teachers and the principals to discipline us. And she organized all the other families in the housing projects. And they all had permission to discipline everybody else's kids. It's not like today where, mm -hmm. you know, an adult looks at you the wrong way. You call, you call child protective services mm -hmm. back in those supposedly <laughs> glory days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, other neighbors and the village would take responsibility to ensure that all other children had some form of, uh, some right. form of discipline. Right. So all this came through. And if I can fast forward... Reno, uh, all nine of my siblings are college graduates. Wow. Uh. All have careers, their families, leading good lives. My mother sadly passed away six years ago. Uh, but she also served as our role model. Once we were old enough to be in high school, to be independent, go off to college, she volunteered to be a translator for Monterey County Department of Social Services. Even though she had just a sixth grade education, she was so smart, determined, organized, they hired her eventually as an eligibility worker for the Monterey County Department of Social Services. Wow. Yeah. She retired heading up the general assistance program for the Monterey oh, yeah. County Department of Social Services. Yeah, and so she's full famous in that area. So to watch yeah. what she did, yeah. notwithstanding the adversity, not just giving back, but developing a role for herself. Right. And to right. bring this great story to full closure, uh, she passed away six years ago after having retired back to Castroville, where, which was her home. Yes. Uh, the Monterey County the, uh, Housing Authority uh, decided to tear down the old housing projects we grew up up and create a new beautiful residential village, mixed use, the latest and smart growth and recreation, and to add 
a new community center, beautiful mm. community center, so that the children would have the computer support so parents could go to classes and social services could be brought to that residential village. And we're proud to say that it is named after her. The wow. Maria J. Wow. Torres Guild Community good. Center. Talk about and, coming full circle. And uh, just uh, last week on our mom's spirit, uh, birthday, October 20th, the residents and several of my siblings were there for her birthday. They held the first annual Maria J. Torres Guild High Tea in honor of her birthday. And now that center is doing all the things my mom used to do. And so it's just wonderful to see life come full circle yeah, in that way. My goodness. My so goodness. you can see why I'm committed to a lifetime of public service, social work, government, public policy. Yeah, yeah. You could almost you could almost say how could you not have been that. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah, she yeah. would haunt me otherwise if yeah, I did not yeah, move yeah. into this field. We could we could spend our whole time yes. just talking about this is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um uh, Fernando, uh, when you, you started uh, in the college and, and uh, started your career and so on in, uh, in the 70s, still the turbulent 70s, a lot of uh, uh, political uh, uh, trials and, uh, and uh, turbulence, um, how, did, uh, how did the, uh, the scene that you found when you started college and maybe before that, how did that how did that influence your choice of uh, profession and direction? Well, you know, since these archives are also about the history of social work, but also Indeed. social progress mm -hmm. over the last period of time, uh, as we got a little older and I went to San Jose State College at the time, I started finally internalizing the stories my mom would tell us about the 1930s and the farm worker strikes. John Steinbeck wrote about it in some of his books, In Dubious Battle, for example. And my mom was, as a young person, farm workers was supportive, involved in what was those communist strikes of the 1930s mm -hmm. in the Salinas Valley, the Pajaro mm -hmm. Valleys. So when I went to San Jose State, I became involved with the United Farm Workers. Back in the late 60s, Cesar Chavez was growing the union attempting to get contracts from the grape growers, the letter growers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so uh, when I wasn't in class or having a good time with friends, we were on the picket line to do our small part to support the United Farm Workers Union. Uh, when it was time for me to go back, to go to graduate school, again, thanks to my mother and others, uh, I knew I needed to get advanced education, the credentials. And uh, so I applied to a number of graduate programs, including in Southern California, USC, UCLA, and certainly uh, back east, and was accepted to some fine schools like Princeton and Syracuse and NYU. And eventually I selected Brandeis University, in part because the Haller Graduate School for Social Policy and Management brought together a lot of my interests. Mm -hmm. But also, if truth be told, because the UFW told me, uh, young man, if you go to Boston, to that Jewish school. <laughs> you can work for the United Farm Workers and stay with us in the farm worker house in Dorchester, Massachusetts and help us organize New England and go to graduate school. Hey, how could I pass up that deal? So set the Brandeis, they treated me well. And after a year, I realized you can't be a full-time organizer and a full-time graduate student. And the union understood, so I devoted my time to working towards my MSW and then mm -hmm. later on my PhD. But the times and the historic period certainly was about activism, mm -hmm. was about community organizing, about empowering disenfranchised populations, about dealing with the social economic disparities of individuals and families. But by going to Brandeis University, I realized that there was also a bigger picture, a macro world out there mm -hmm. about politics and governance and uh, legislation and what it was about our unique form of democratic constitutional form of government embedded in a capitalist system that meant I needed to better understand the complexity of who really controls and who really makes decisions. Right. Making making that uh, that leap from uh, from San Jose to Boston uh, was a 
pivotal point mm -hmm. in your in your life, and no doubt you would have made contributions had you stayed in San Jose and continued with the farm workers and so on. Uh, but making that leap must have been quite a difficult thing for you in some ways. Leaving my comfort zone was very difficult, and with pressure from those who cared about me, my family, my friends, and others in San Jose and California to stay and stay in that community and, as we would say in Spanish, serve your gente, you know, serve your people mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. The pressures were all, were all to stay. But fortunately, I had some wonderful mentors among my professors at San Jose State that essentially would tell me in so many words, take the road less traveled. Mm -hmm. Test yourself. Get away from what you know. See what else is out there. And someday it will help you to return and be more effective in the things that you cared about. Mm -hmm. And so I took that leap into the unknown. I took that chance. I had no idea where Brandeis was or what the <laughs> East Coast was like. I'd never been out of the San Francisco Bay Area. Threw everything in my car and just drove east until I came to the Atlantic Ocean. And as I got to know Boston and New England, I was ready to come back to California. Everything was different and old and a strange world. And the first semester of Brandeis was very hard because I been. was ready to give it up and return back. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, people looked at me and befriended me and encouraged me, hang in there, hang in there. It was the best thing I could have done to stay there because not only did it test me and broaden my perspectives about the complexity of this world, but it showed me that you could have a community wherever you go. Mm -hmm. That I wasn't leaving Salinas or San Jose or the farm workers or my family or friends, but I was adding to my portfolio of community and networks mm -hmm. that I could also serve and care about and in turn would add to my ability to influence things. And uh, yes, it was hard. It was the best decision I've made. I now push my students that have never left Southern California or California, and in so many words, tell them, leave, mm -hmm. test yourself, mm -hmm. go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You will be more effective over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Much bigger stage, more complex, uh, very different. Uh, but in the end, uh, it was pivotal, was it, was it not? That who, who at Brandeis, uh, do you have one or two maybe mentors at Brandeis mm -hmm. who began to steer you into what would now become this very long and distinguished career that you've had? I was so fortunate when I went to Brandeis in New England and Boston to meet and become close to a number of crucial mentors whether a Roland Warren or an Arnold Gurin or Robert Perlman, the greats in yeah, great. social work and yes. Jewish community yeah. services. I mean, these people befriended me and mm -hmm. took me under their wings. To meet the faculty that would someday open up a whole nother world in gerontology and health care, the person that later became my dissertation chairperson, Robert Binstock. Oh, yes. the leading person in the politics of aging, to get to know new communities, the Puerto Rican, Italian, Jewish, Irish communities of New England. Uh, a short little story. I never knew when I left California, I never knew that white people could be poor. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I grew up only seeing Mexicans, Filipinos, <laughs> African Americans, Chinese poor. Uh, in right. the Salinas Valley, in right. the Santa Clara Valley, right. I, although non-Hispanic whites right. all right. seem to do reasonably well. Until I went to New England and I realized what it meant to be a poor Irish, poor Italian, you know, poor Jewish, and to realize that ultimately economic disparities is not necessarily about race or ethnicity. It's about income and education right. and right. power and powerlessness. So it opened it up. And to fast forward, I met in New England those that would ultimately get me to the national stage in terms of what I subsequently did after I graduated. Tell us about, tell us about that, how you got onto the national stage very early in your career. Uh, mm -hmm. Your experience in Washington probably had a profound impact mm -hmm. on how it shaped your direction. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about that. 
ultimately, as you know from my bio, I had the great good fortune to have obtained three presidential appointments, to be a staff director of a congressional committee, to have been selected a White House fellow. And I can now say, after all these years, none of that would have happened had I stayed in San Jose, California, yes. or returned back to Monterey County. It would never have happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, I can only thank those who pushed me to get the heck out of yeah. my comfort zone. Yeah. But it all began at Brandeis, both uh, because unlike the few other Latino students who went to the Boston area schools and were so cloistered and timid and just stayed with each other and were just waiting so they could go back to Texas or the Southwest of California, I made it a point to get to know other communities. So when I wasn't with the UFW or studying, I would travel to New Hampshire and Vermont and upstate New York and to Canada and go out and meet new people in those different communities. That's where I began to develop my connections with the Kennedy family, with the Dukakis family, with those who would ultimately connect me to the Clinton family and the Clinton campaigns. And it was those early connections with these strange people that I would never have met otherwise and retaining those relationships and staying in touch and making myself available to get to know new people that ultimately became the network of support and contacts that enabled me to fast forward through the necessary steps to be selected as a political appointee at the highest levels in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Mm -hmm. And again, that's one of the lessons I tell my students. Broaden your base of who you know. Nurture those contacts. Stay in touch. It's work, but it's part of what you do to be a leader, to be effective in terms of social change. And it was at Brandeis where I began to understand what social policy and the role of government and the federal government is all about. And I like to tell the story that when uh, one of my advisors, James Schultz, asked me, uh, young man, would you like to go make a little extra money? Of course, graduate students are always looking for extra money. Well, there's this conference in Washington, D.C., and we have a grant to evaluate that conference, and uh, we'll pay you to go there with some other students, and you'll work with me, and we'll evaluate the conference. It was the 1971 White House Conference on Aging. On aging. Oh, My okay. first introduction to this new field called gerontology. And I went there and I came away with this revelation. This is an exciting new field. And I met all these incredible leaders from throughout the country and minority aging. You know, I could just begin to list many of them, but I won't just yet, including some feisty old lady that had us all march to the White House to protest the lack of minority involvement. Maggie Kuhn, oh, the leader yes. of the Great Panthers. Great Panthers so, who yeah. is that ornery old lady? She <laughs> sure talks loud. And Maggie Kuhn, who later became a dear friend wow. and mentor. So when it came time for my dissertation, I was torn, and I went to Francis Carroll and James Schultz and others. I said, I came to Brandeis to do work on Hispanic politics. Uh, but now I'm really interested in gerontology. And... I want to do something with, you know, farm workers, and I don't know which one to choose. And I believe it was Frank Carroll, who's at UMass Boston, who said, young man, why do you have to choose? Has anyone done any work on the politics of aging in the Hispanic community? Voila. Yeah. There my together. dissertation, yeah. my first book, and allowed me to fast forward my career, looking at a whole new area. Right. So these are just examples of how being back there opened up new worlds for me. Uh, I, I don't want to miss for this interview the, just the factual, you mentioned three major kinds of involvement in Washington, D.C., and just for the record, we should, we should identify those. One was the White House fellow, and the year would, would have been 70. My, I refer to them as my tours of duty. Yes. And uh, my first tour was to be selected as a White House fellow. An incredible honor, very competitive, and it essentially moves your career at lightning speed by having you either serve as a special assistant to cabinet secretary or White House staff. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Just puts you right into the and middle. That was circa. That was 1978. 1978. Okay. And I was uh, just thrilled to be selected. 15 out of 2,500 applicants, and uh, I became special assistant to the secretary of HEW, Joseph Califano. Califano. And then I stayed on till the end of the Carter administration as special assistant to Pat Harris, who became the subsequent secretary of HEW. And I was involved in designing the logo, which became the logo for the new Department of Health and Human Services. And I handled I handled refugee and resettlement services, uh, human development services, and later senior citizen programs in ATW during the Carter administration. Right. Uh, then uh, in the mid 80s, again through my connections, I was brought back to Washington D.C. to be staff director of the House Select Committee on Aging for a, another mentor, Congressman Edward Roybal from. Los Angeles. That was the mid '80s, and then uh, already having this portfolio of experience back east in Washington, being active in Los Angeles. uh, I remember the day that I got a call from uh, some folks I'd been involved previously in an issues director for Al Gore's campaign, other presidential campaigns that wanted to stay involved, and somebody came and said, "Uh, Fernando, there's this. Southern governor running for president, and uh, he doesn't know Los Angeles or California well. And uh, would you uh, be interested in being an issues advisor on issues of gerontology in Southern California? And I said, well, I never heard of this guy, and the Democrats aren't doing too good in, in, at, in politics. We'll probably lose again, but I'll do my duty. And at, at for so I get a call from the office of some governor called Bill Clinton. Yeah. <laughs> and I subsequently I became an issues advisor for the California campaign for Bill Clinton and got right. to know him well in the campaign. And uh, no one expected him to win, but he did. And I promised my wife, dear, we're not going back. I had you back there during the Carter administration. I had you back there in the 80s when I worked on the Hill. We just bought our home in Highland Park. You know, I promised we're going to settle down. And I just got a call from the uh, transition team, and uh, they asked me if I'll at least come back and work on the transition for Bill Clinton's new presidential administration. But I'll just be there for a month or two. And uh, sure enough, as I was worried, a call comes not too much later from uh, Donna Shalala. St. Fernando, I've heard about you, I know about you and the things you've been doing, and I'm being nominated as the new secretary of HHS. I want you to be my first appointee to join my team. What will it take for you to come on board? And I said, well, Donna, uh, I don't just want to be commissioner on aging. I want to have direct access to you, the White House, and I'd like to elevate that position, blah, blah, blah. And, so I suggested a number of things that could not be done, and, but if you can do them, I'll join you. But I knew it could not be done. About two months later, she called Fernando. The president signed off, OMB signed off. Everything you wanted, we have. I, was, I had no choice but to join the Clinton administration as the first assistant secretary on aging a dream job. The first one. The first one. Created. But prior to that time, it had been just a commissioner It had just been aging. commissioner on aging. Mm-hmm. And uh, then a uh, wonderful first term, came back to keep my tenure, but I was brought back in the Obama administration as the vice chair of the National Council on Disability. So those have been my uh, national appointments. So you had really four, four. significant uh, involvement. Uh, so... Uh, Early on, as you discovered this interest in gerontology at the White House conference, and then it, it matures and, and really becomes a kind of a life direction for you. Uh, writ large, what, what were you wanting to do for older people in this country? Uh, not for Hispanics, but as you said, for, for older other older people in general. What were, your, what were the goals? What were the things that you, your touchstones? Uh, well, that question, uh, Reno, Professor Patty, is very much how I think I've tried to juxtapose social work, social policy, d- 
demographics and the role of national government. And when I first moved into the field of gerontology, it was about the needs of minority elders, Latino, African American, Native American, Asian, and Pacific Islanders, who was, it was very clear from the little data available, uh, were not sharing in the uh, entitlement programs of public benefits, and that minority elders had much higher rates of poverty, greater dependence on SSI and Social Security for their retirement, and essentially were facing multiple jeopardies once they were older. Mm -hmm. That caused me to think, was this vulnerability in old age because they became old, or were there factors in their life course mm -hmm. that led towards this vulnerability? That then led me to look at the issue of income, education, social economic status, and what it means when you're young, and what it means through a life course. And beginning to do research in the broader dimensions of demography and aging and the policy political implications made it very clear over time that all of us face unique things when we're younger that can have a determinant effect when you're older. Suffice to say, if you're a poor, younger, uneducated person, the odds are you will be a poor, dependent, vulnerable elder. And if we are to address poverty in old age, we must address poverty and those disadvantages among younger cohorts. And so much of what I do now is about that lifespan and about investing in the emerging populations of this new majority-minority nation so it's not just because we want to be politically correct and help disenfranchised minorities and low-income groups. We're really talking about giving them a greater chance to live a longer lifespan with the measure of dignity and a quality of life and retirement and health security. Mm -hmm. And about investing in young people so that they can grow old, independent, and be able to enjoy that added longevity. Mm -hmm. So my work today is very much about aging, about aging baby boomers, about young ethnic minority low-income groups and what we should be doing for them as they are younger. Mm -hmm. And ultimately to ensure that we protect and have a robust social safety net. The very things that enabled my mother, my grandmother, my siblings, notwithstanding our vulnerabilities, to have this incredible investment from a generous AFTC program, mm -hmm. from the generosity of charitable groups, from a period of time in the last century when the public actually believed that we should tax ourselves to help other people the social contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all this is in jeopardy, as we know. Mm -hmm. The ideological battles going back and forth are about whether or not we should retain a safety net or entitlement okay. programs. I mean, yeah. these are great debates, and I believe strongly uh, that what my family benefited from in the last century, we need to retain and expand. And as a gerontologist, it really is about ensuring that we can enjoy our added years without greater vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So that is how I have tried to bring back social work, social policy, social welfare, my experiences at the national level, and certainly with my own personal mm -hmm. experiences and what my family went through. As you look at, uh, let's say, juxtapose uh, uh, policies and programs uh, for uh, the elderly, at 1970 and, and today, 2014. Uh, where have the greatest successes mm -hmm. been? Uh, where have the greatest failures been, mm -hmm. both in general and, and your own, in, in mm -hmm. pushing that agenda and trying to, uh, trying to advance the yeah. interest of? Great question. Well, first, it's helpful to note that we will, over the next 20 years, see a doubling of the older population, those 65 and over. As a matter of fact, in 2014, every member of the 78 plus million baby boomers turned 50 years of age. Mm. Wow. By 2029, every member of that baby boom cohort, which will be twice as many as today's elderly, will be 65 years of age and over. Mm. What have been the successes and the failures since the last century and how we address 
the needs of older person, the absolute greatest success has been Social Security. Mm -hmm. It's not just a successful public benefit program, which has dramatically lowered poverty rates and given families the choice of living independently and not having to have your parents move in with you. Mm -hmm. But it has kept the middle class. It's especially benefited low-income individuals and minority groups. So Social Security retaining its social insurance features alongside Medicare have been our greatest successes. Where have we failed? By taking those programs for granted. Uh, by having a new cohort of elders, baby boomers in this case, beginning to lose sight of why we needed these programs in the first place and why we need to retain them. We now see with that baby boomer cohort, unlike their parents and grandparents, the lowest rates of savings, the highest rates of debt, the lowest rate of defined benefit and pension coverage, mm -hmm. yet enjoying longer added years than their parents and grandparents. So. We are faced with the possibility that baby boomers may be the next great group of poor, vulnerable elders. And we may well see, and we are now, an increase now in poverty rates among the early cohorts of baby boomers. So I'd say one of our greatest failures as a society, as voters, as middle-aged persons growing old, we have lost sight of why we first needed to create the programs of the New Deal and the great society, and why they were needed in the first place. Mm -hmm. We've taken them for granted. And my baby boomer friends, almost without exception, just think, I will have at least as much as my mom and dad had and my grandparents. So even if I didn't save, even if my kids are estranged from me, even if my house is underwater, I will at least get all these great things my parents and grandparents are receiving. Mm -hmm. The reality is, that increasingly the electorate and the Congress and politicians on both sides of the aisle aren't convinced we need those mm -hmm. programs anymore. Mm -hmm. That's our failure, mm -hmm. losing sight of the need to re-energize this social contract. So I'm hoping in the next 5, 10, 15 years, I may still have to be active to work on that. And I'm, I am a board member of AARP. That's one role I play yeah. to promote this re-energizing the social contract. Otherwise, we're going to have a new generation of elders that are going to be in pretty, pretty uh, insecure shape. position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the pri mm -hmm. privatization of uh, attempts, uh, privatized Social Security. Of are all decent. emblematic yes. of the public no longer right. is convinced. And especially uh, those under 50 are no longer as convinced that we need the programs. Mm -hmm. And if truth be told, a large proportion of the elderly today are willing to give up those social programs for younger generations. And uh, President Obama faces an interesting uh, situation, uh, you know, elected as the first African-American president Every age group, especially young people, supported him in both elections. The one age group that vo has voted against him consistently are the 65 and over. The one age group that is most opposed to the Affordable Care Act and trying to expand universal health care coverage are the 65 and over population. So we've done these great things for older persons today, and they become quite a conservative constituency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have theirs. But they've lost sight of why these things are needed for younger groups. So I'm also doing my part to uh, find a new narrative so that we can educate and compel older voters who hold significant influence in the electorate that it isn't just about protecting your Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and all these other senior programs but that uh, you, as an older retiree with the defined benefit plan, also have a commitment to help these emerging young populations, mm -hmm. not just because it's the right thing to do as social workers, but because it's these young people that we will count on to pay the taxes to maintain the public benefits 
that today's elderly enjoy. So we need a narrative that gets beyond the ideological debates that isn't about a liberal conservative viewpoint. But I, I go on and on. But this is uh, something that I try to do now. I wanted to just uh, push that point just a little bit. So, so one of the great challenges facing um, um, social work and, and other human services, public policy and so on, it's somehow retained this infrastructure that, that, that brought so many poor people out of poverty and to prevent uh, a recurrence of another generation of aging poverty. So where, do, where does organized social work, individual social workers, where do they come in on that? What, what couldn't they do? I mean, beyond the individual services provided? Well, uh, Professor Petty, therein lies, I think, another contribution I'm attempting to make to broaden social work's role and influence and portfolio of agendas. Uh, in my career as a proud social worker, I've always tried to bring in the values of social justice and giving back, not unlike what my mother taught us and what social workers that took care of us when we were younger brought to us. Uh, but I worry that other disciplines, other professions, have more influence in these great debates about maintaining or not keeping a, a, a social safety net. Mm -hmm. And those other disciplines are law and business and communication and the private sector. In many ways, they have far greater influence over what the Congress will decide to do or not decide to do, mm -hmm. over whatever mm -hmm. or whatever national administration will do and in terms would of have privatization. Seen this at, and I've seen that secretary. at the national level. Yeah. I was, for example, a member of President Clinton's welfare reform group that ultimately right. reshaped right. the old uh, AFTC program into TANA. Right. Right. And of the 20 members in that group, I was the only one that had actually lived on welfare and public housing. And of the 20 of us, I think there was just two of us who were MSWs. Right. All the others were political players, mm -hmm. were business and law, or journalism or communication. Mm -hmm. That's where the clout and the influence is. So I try to reinforce to my social work colleagues that uh, macro social work is not only important, but the social worker needs to become part of other disciplines, which is why I so enjoy UCLA, where we work closely with urban planning and public policy mm -hmm. and our Luskin schools of public affairs, where we have our joint degree programs with business and economics and law and medicine. So increasingly, I feel that social work has the values, but not necessarily all the answers for the complex yeah, social sure, problems, sure. that it must be both interdisciplinary and it must cut across boundaries. And social workers cannot afford to operate on politically correct ideological positions, but must work in that messy world of compromise mm -hmm. and partisan politics and find common cause with Republicans and independents. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to do my part to bring what social work has, which is a unique commitment to individuals, families, and community and the values of social justice and compassion and progressive mm -hmm. politics, mm -hmm. but to do so by working in the real world of political stakeholders and strange bedfellows, as we like to call them. So that's as, what I tried to do. As a sidebar, uh, just this last uh, uh, charge, essentially, to the profession, uh, how do we get more social workers involved in big picture policy, ah. <laughs> politics, and so on. I mean, well, isn't that a challenge? Uh, first, firstly, as a matter of fact, something we're addressing at UCLA, firstly, with all due respect to the Council on Social Work Education. Yes, due respect to them. <laughs> <laughs> we need to loosen up that curriculum. It's just way too structured, way too restricted. Uh, at UCLA, because we're part of the School of Public Affairs, which is about leadership and social change, and policy analysis and the practical skills in our constitutional form of government, we would like to modify our curriculum to bring about policy analysis and leadership and even some version of management to the MSW curriculum, mm -hmm. at least to a macro program. 
And, you know, we have to struggle rightfully with CFWE that cares about quality, consistent education. Uh, but I think social work curriculum and how we train social workers needs to maybe go back to what it was once, as I have been informed by Harry Speck, for example, mm -hmm. one of my mm -hmm. favorite people who's passed away a number of years ago from yeah. Berkeley, yeah. that uh, it was social work in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s that really brought about the settlement movement, that organized entire communities, that found ways to incorporate refugees and immigrants to this country, that worked hand in gloves with government and politicians and power brokers, and even corrupt institutions like Tammany Hall. Mm -hmm. But social workers, as I understand my social work history, back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, right. was more enmeshed in who controls and who decides. Yes. And I think social work today has become more about the professional priorities of credentialing and financing and reimbursement and clinical social mm -hmm. work, all of which are critical and needed. But I choose to push my colleagues in social work. But education for leadership. Education for leadership and, and, and policy change, policy right, advocacy. Right, right. One last question. We just have a couple <laughs> minutes left. With all due respect to CSW. <laughs> yeah, with all due respect. Well, <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, if you had it to do over again, uh, would you have followed the same life course? Is there anything you can imagine you might have done differently? If I had to do it over again, which is a fascinating question that causes me to step back and think, what if I had to do it over again? Would I have just stayed in San Jose, California, settled for being a small fish in a small pond and just raising or a family a or a big yeah. fish in a small pond? I think I can honestly say, Reno Patty, who has known me for many years, not only would I do it all over again, that road less traveled, but I can honestly say I would not have changed anything, including not changing the fact that I contracted polio when I was very young mm -hmm. and had to go through that, or having to grow up in a difficult you know, situation with, that a mom went through, because those are the lessons of adversity and perseverance that enable one to persevere over a long period of time. And so now when I see my baby boomer friends who have had a reasonably good life, an able body, and now the vicissitudes, a crisis hits, I find how much harder it is for them to adjust later in life to a crisis, a health crisis, personal crisis, social crisis. And in my case, I feel really lucky. I have a, I've had an entire lifetime to get ready for it <laughs> and to practice. So I can honestly say I think that uh, I would not have changed a thing. This all led to a wonderful career a great partner and spouse and my wife for 35 years and a great family and now I enjoy just not only staying in the game but become a patriarch of our extended family and continuing what my mom believed in and grandparents believed in so uh, it's been a good ride a good life I wouldn't have changed a thing and hope I get a few more years to uh, keep uh, pushing ahead thank you sir Thank you, Fernando, and uh, we all hope that uh, you continue to do exactly what you've been doing. And uh, I think we'll have to wrap up. Our time's over, yes. but thank you so much.